So, very warm welcome to this first discussion or lecture session on the course IC211. Professor Surya Narayan has already explained to you the purpose and the objectives of this course, right. And today our objective is to discuss the first experiment that you shall be doing over the next week. What I mean by that is different batches will be doing experiments on different days, but essentially it will be the same objectives for all the batches. The background of the experiment that we are going to do is to look at an electrical circuit which can reduce noise. Now, noise is a common problem in most, most kinds of equipment, whether it is electronic, whether it is mechanical or any other, even hydraulic for that matter. Right? Noise, what does noise mean? Noise essentially is a random phenomenon a phenomenon which cannot be captured by describing it clearly as a function of time. At every point in time for a function or for a signal, you could query the value of the signal. Suppose you record an audio signal, right? You could query the value of the audio signal at a point in time. If it is recorded as a voltage value, it could be, you could ask at time t equal to 0.3 seconds, what is the value of the audio signal? 0.3 volts. 0.6 volts, all right. So, a signal, a deterministic signal can clearly be specified as a value against every time. Unlike that, a noise signal can only be specified as what is called a random variable for every time. So, all that can be said for noise as an example is that when you record it at the value at the point, let us say 0 0.3 seconds, the value might be between 0.2 volts and 0.3 volts with a probability of 10 percent. That is all that you can say. All of you understand probability. Yeah. So, all that we can say is, well, you know, when you record this noise phenomenon between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 seconds on the time scale, its value is likely, sorry, when you record it at 0.3 seconds on the time scale, its value is likely to be between 0.2 and 0.3 seconds, uh, 0.3 volts with a probability of 10 percent. It can be let us say between 0.3 volts and 0.5 volts with a probability of 60 percent. So, this is all that can be said about noise. In, in short, a noise, a noise phenomenon is always characterized by a density for every time, a probability density function for every time. That is called a random, it is called a stochastic process. Now, those are technical terms. What we are trying to bring out here in this experiment is a methodology to reduce noise. And one common assumption that one can reasonably make about noise is that it varies very quickly and it varies much faster than most reasonable physical phenomena. So, even for example, when you look at the noise that you encounter in a power supply, so that is the first example of noise that you might see. If you were to look at, you, you think the power supply is 50 hertz in frequency. But if you were to actually monitor the waveform on a ketho, on a on an oscilloscope on a display device, you would see that it is far from being a sine wave exactly. It has a lot of fluctuation about the sinusoidal pattern. All right, that fluctuation is of course due to noise. Now that fluctuation occurs much faster than the 50 hertz that you are trying to monitor. This is an example. Take any other example when you make measurements. You know, you are trying to measure say a length or you are trying to measure a quantity with a mechanical device. Now, you stabilize the pointers of the mechanical instrument so as to take your measurement and there is some amount of motion which does not allow you to take a measurement precisely. Typically, that motion is much faster than the rate at which you take measurements and therefore, that is another example of a situation where the noise phenomenon is much faster than the phenomenon which you are trying to observe. This is in general, this is very often, I would not say it is always the case, but in most situations that one would encounter at least as a beginner, one would see that the noise phenomenon is much faster than the so called signal phenomenon or the phenomenon which you are trying to measure, observe or study. Now, as electrical engineers, I mean that is my bias. Uh, Incidentally, I should have introduced myself. So, uh, you know, my name is Vikram M. Gadre. I am a faculty member in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And I am going to be supervising your first experiment, which 
as you can see projected here relates to noise removal or noise reduction. And as I said, you know, with the with, with an electrical engineer's bias, we tend to think of most signals as a linear combination of sine waves. So, we say as long as we have reasonable signals to deal with, by reasonable I mean most of the signals that you would encounter in practical life, in ordinary life, right. Most reasonable signals can be thought of as a linear combination of sine waves. What does that mean? It means that I can think of them as instead of describing them as a function of time, I could describe it as follows. I could say well, so you know what I am trying to bring out in, in short very briefly is the idea of a different domain in which you can describe a signal. So, one way to describe a signal is this time value value could be voltage, current, pressure, temperature, all right, whatever it is, there you are. The other way of describing a signal is what I am just going to describe, namely the frequency domain. So, what I say is, well, I talk about the frequency of the sine wave and of course, it could be the angular frequency for convenience. And for the moment, let us start from 0 and go towards infinity. And I say, well, at every frequency, now here we have to understand things a little better. Suppose you had a periodic phenomenon, a phenomenon which repeats every so much of time. Many of you would probably be exposed to the idea of harmonics, right. So, for example, what, what really is a harmonic? Well, a harmonic is a multiple of the basic frequency. So, for example, if you have a periodic phenomenon which varies at 50 hertz, let us talk about the power supply as an example. The power supply is supposed to be a sine wave of frequency 50 hertz, is that right? Many of you know this, yeah. How many of you know that the power supply is a signal of 50 hertz frequency? Yeah, many of you do. Good. Now, the fact that it is not quite a sine wave of 50 hertz frequency can be expressed in another way by saying that it is a sine wave of frequency 50 hertz plus another sine wave of frequency 100 hertz plus another of 150 hertz and all multiples of 50 hertz in fact, in principle all the way up to infinity. Now, these other frequencies 100, 150, 200 and so on are called harmonics. So, ideally the harmonics should have had an amplitude of 0, but they do not have an amplitude of 0. This is our way of describing a situation where there is a distortion in the basic periodic pattern. All right. So, any periodic function with a periodic frequency of f can be described as a combination of sine waves with frequency f, 2 f, 3 f and all multiples of f. All right. Now, suppose your phenomenon is not periodic. What is another way of looking at it? You could say the phenomenon is periodic, but with a period of infinity. Is that right? So, phenomenon which is not periodic can be thought of as periodic with a period of infinity. Now, if it is if its period is infinity, how much is the fundamental frequency? 0. Is that right? So, that means that when you go from periodic to aperiodic phenomena, you are coming from fundamental frequencies which go towards 0. That means, instead of dealing with a discrete set of frequencies f, 2 f, 3 f and so on, you are now dealing with the continuous frequency axis. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah. Anybody to whom this is not clear? So, do not don't, uh, hesitate to raise your hands. So, I am saying that if you have an aperiodic phenomenon, phenomenon which is not periodic, you could think of it as a sum of many sine waves, but the, the fundamental frequency tends to 0, which means the sine waves now have frequencies that are continuous. Is that right? So, instead of a sum, you have an integral. That is that's a, that's a technical detail. But what it means is, I must describe this phenomenon in terms of a continuous axis now, which starts from 0, goes towards infinity. And what is the, now this axis, actually there are two functions to, to be described here. There is a magnitude function and there is a phase function. So, let us say for example, this is the magnitude function. And let us say this is the phase function. Of course, the phase function must lie between minus pi and pi over an angle of 2 pi. So, 
So, of course, I said this must be between pi and minus pi. So, you could have some kind of a phase function, does not matter what it is, I have just drawn something here. I am just trying to bring out the physical interpretation. What is the physical interpretation? For example, if I were to pick this frequency here, if I were to pick this frequency here, I am going to denote it as capital omega naught. Then I mark the amplitude point and I mark the phase point for omega naught. And suppose this phase is 3 pi by 4, just as an example. And this magnitude here is 4 units, all right. What is the interpretation? The interpretation is that this signal includes sine waves of frequencies around omega naught with an amplitude 4 phase 3 pi by 4. All right. This is the way we interpret it. So, what I mean to bring out here is Typically, if you look at the frequency axis, most phenomena are going to be predominant in magnitude around the lower frequencies. And if you have a significant presence of higher frequencies, it is due to noise. Is that right? So, the simplest way to reduce noise is to emphasize the lower frequencies and to de-emphasize the higher frequencies. So, what we are trying to do in this experiment is to look at one electrical circuit which would do exactly this. Emphasize lower frequencies and de-emphasize higher frequencies. Is the objective absolutely clear? Any questions with the objective? Right? Straightforward? Yes? How do we do that? Now, to do that, one must first agree that I must be able to deal with different frequencies in a decoupled way. That means, I must be able to say definitively what this particular circuit does to a sine wave of a particular frequency. You know, I, it should not depend on what other sine waves are present, if you know what I mean. So, if I know there is a sine wave of frequency, let us say 50 hertz present with this amplitude and this phase, and if I pass it through the circuit, I know exactly what is going to happen to the 50 hertz sine wave when it comes out of the circuit. I do not need to worry about whether there is a 100 hertz sine wave present or not, or whether there is a 200 hertz sine wave present or not. All right. So, that means, each frequency can be, can be dealt with in a decoupled manner. That is the first thing that we need. What does it mean? It means that if I were to give a sine wave as an excitation, as an input voltage, the output in every part of the circuit must also be a sine wave of the same frequency. Is that clear? Right. So, we must first build a circuit where if I gave a sinusoidal input of a certain frequency, the output must be sinusoidal everywhere in the circuit. The voltage current everywhere must be sinusoidal of the same frequency everywhere in the circuit. What could change at different places is the amplitude and the phase. Now, one very beautiful property of the three basic elements that we deal with in electrical circuits, namely the resistance, I am going to show all the three symbols to you, the resistance the inductance and the capacitance. Is that they obey this property? So, if I were to give a sinusoidal input to it, the output would be sinusoidal. By input, I mean if I were to make a sinusoidal current input to any of them, the voltage would also be sinusoidal with the same frequency. If I were to give a sinusoidal voltage of a certain frequency, the output would be a current of the same frequency, sinusoidal of course. And the reason for that is easy to see. If you look at the voltage current descriptions of each of these, what are they? The resistance is described very simply by V is equal to I R, or let me write everything as a function of time. So, V t is R times I t, resistance. 
V t is L d i d t, okay, inductance. d v t d t times c is i t for a capacitance. All right, simple. Now, what is the beautiful property that all these circuits enjoy? All of them relate the voltage and current either proportionally or through a derivative. Now, when you take the derivative of a sine wave of a certain frequency, it also results in a sine wave of the same frequency. When you add two sine waves of the same frequency, they become a sine wave of the same frequency. Is that right? So, when you apply Kirchhoff's current law or Kirchhoff's voltage law, where you, whereupon you add currents or add voltages, and if each of them is a sinusoid of, a, of the same frequency, the resultant would also be a sinusoid of the same frequency. If you take the derivative at any point, it is still a sinusoid of the same frequency. And this is the reason why, if you construct a circuit out of resistances, inductances, and capacitances, and if you were to excite it with a sinusoidal source, the resultant is a sinusoid all over the circuit. Okay, so, this is the basic premise from which we begin. Now, suppose I were to conduct, uh, suppose I were to connect a resistance and a capacitance in series like this. I wish to excite here, excite this pair of terminals with a sinusoidal source. So, let me, you know, let, let me write it down. Let me call the source, say, V0 cos omega naught t plus phi naught. And my objective is to find out the output here. Now, the first thing to do is to establish a methodology for obtaining this output. How do we analyze a circuit like this? All right. Well, the first thing we are going to do is to go away from sine waves. So, what we are going to do is to agree that if you have a rotating complex number, so now pay careful attention. This is a slightly tricky principle, but not too difficult once you pay attention. If you have a complex number, so visualize this paper to be the complex plane here. This is the origin of the complex plane. And if you were to rotate, right, so a complex number with a magnitude of V naught and an initial angle of phi naught at an angular velocity of omega naught in the counterclockwise direction, then its projection on the real axis is indeed a cosine, a cosinusoid, is not it? What is its projection? So, how is this complex number described? It is V naught e raised to the power j. So, all of you are familiar with this representation, right? the polar representation, I am sure. So, omega naught t plus phi naught. Everybody is familiar with this representation? Anybody not familiar with this representation? All right. Anybody not familiar? No. Now, of course, it has a real and imaginary part. The real part is, is, is what we started off with here. All right. Now, what we are going to do is to work with this instead of the original sine wave. And you will see the reason soon why. Okay. When we take the derivative of a sine wave, it is indeed a sine wave of the same frequency, but the derivative is not proportional to the original sine wave. You see what I mean? Let me, let me illustrate by contrast. On the other hand, if you were to take this complex number, so let us call this as a function of t x of t. If you were to take d x t d t here, what does it give you? It gives you, I am sure all of you can work it out. In fact, it gives you j omega naught x t. Do you all agree? Yes. So, what does it mean? It means the derivative is 
proportional to the original function. So, you know, taking the derivative can be replaced by an operation of multiplication here. All right. Now, this is very similar to what happens in a resistance. So, for example, suppose you had an inductor. Suppose this were the current. You know, suppose you had x t as the current in an inductor. Let us take an example. Suppose the suppose the current of an in, the inductor had a current of i naught e raised to the power j omega naught t plus phi naught. Of course, this is an imaginary situation. We are talking about complex numbers. I know that we cannot actually have complex currents, but let us imagine that for a minute. Suppose you could have complex values for a current. What would be the corresponding inductor voltage? It would be can you see it will be essentially j omega naught times L multiplied by the current, right. So, this is as if this inductor, does everybody agree with this? Yeah, L d i d t. So, it is j omega naught L times the, the current. Now, what does it mean? It means the inductor in the sense of this current behaves as if it were a resistance of value j omega naught L. So, if you allow for complex resistances, so to speak, then you can accommodate inductors, capacitors and resistors all as generalized resistances. Similarly, what would, so therefore, if you, you know, if you want to generalize this idea of resistance to the context of inductor and capacitor, the first thing we should do is to use a different name, right. So, instead of calling these things resistances, we will call them impedances, right. So, we will talk about impedances now. In fact, the word impedance has the same broad connotation as the word resistance. Why do we call a resistance a resistance? Because in, in given a certain voltage, the resistance in some sense opposes the flow of current. The extent to which it opposes the flow of current is the resistance. Is that right? Now, the word impedance, the word impede means the same thing to stop, to come in the way of, right. So, an impedance is a term used to denote how much of opposition this element offers to the flow of current when you apply a voltage. All right? So, therefore, the impedance is essentially the voltage by the current, but only in the context of rotating complex numbers. I am expecting that you are taking down, that is why I am writing it there. I am expecting that you are noting this down, all right. Now, these rotating complex numbers are also given a name in electrical engineering, they are called phasers. So, let us write down the impedances of all the three kinds of elements that we encounter. R has an impedance of R. An inductor has an impedance of j omega naught L. A capacitor has an impedance of 1 by j omega naught C. Let me derive the case of a capacitance just for completeness. So, for a capacitance you know that C d v d t, C v t, d v t d t is I t, right. Now, if I t is of the form I naught e raised to the power j omega naught t plus phi naught, then V t can essentially be obtained by integrating 1 by c integral. Let us take the indefinite integral for the moment. And you could then work out, I mean I leave it to you to work out V t by I t and show that it is equal to 1 by j omega naught c. So, now we have an easy situation to deal with. You have this resistance and inductance in uh, resistance and capacitance in series, all right, and you have a sine wave which you have applied. What I am going to do is to replace the sine wave by this rotating complex number. Why am I doing it? 
because once I do that, then I can treat both the resistance and capacitance as an impedance. And I could analyze the circuit as if I were analyzing a circuit comprised only of resistors. Okay. What would be the so called impedance of this capacitor? 1 by j omega c as a function of omega of course. Now, it is very easy to write down the output voltage by the input voltage here. The output voltage by the input voltage is how much? That is very easily done by using the voltage divider principle. It is essentially this impedance divided by this impedance plus this impedance. If, it, if they were resistors, you would write that down by inspection. So, the output by the input would be essentially 1 by j omega naught c divided by r plus 1 by j omega naught c. And we can simplify that. Let us do that. So, this is this ratio of the output to the input is called the transfer function of the circuit. It is also called the frequency response of the circuit and we will understand in a minute why. What is the frequency response of the circuit? It is one, now one can simplify it, it is 1 by 1 plus j omega naught c r. All right. What does this physically mean? This physically means two things. So, this frequency response is a complex number, right? Let us give it a name, let us call it capital H of, it is a function of omega naught. Assuming that the value of the capacitance and the resistance are fixed, it is a value of capital omega naught. Now, let us plot the magnitude and the angle of H omega naught. In fact, it is really the magnitude in which we are interested. So, let us look at the magnitude, magnitude of h omega naught. Let us forget about the angle for the moment. How much is it the magnitude? It is essentially 1 by 1 plus omega naught squared c squared r squared under root positive. All right. Let us plot this as a function of omega naught. So, now you know visualize the physical situation here. I have this resistance and capacitance connected in series. I have the flexibility of connecting a voltage source which is of a sinusoidal nature at the input and I have a flexibility of moving the knob of frequency to change the frequency. That is the physical situation. And I want to find out how the output amplitude varies as a function. I, I can assume that the input amplitude is held constant. So, at the input I have a sine wave generator which generates a sine wave of a fixed amplitude. So, I can ensure the amplitude remains constant and I change the frequency and I am interested in seeing what happens to the output amplitude as a function of frequency. Simple. So, let us plot that. It is very easy to see at omega equal to 0, of course, the amplitude is 1. As omega naught tends to infinity, the amplitude is 0 and in fact, it decreases monotonically from 0 towards infinity. What is the physical meaning of this? It means that this circuit in effect emphasizes lower frequencies or in other words keeps lower frequencies more or less as they are, but it de-emphasizes higher frequencies. So, it suppresses higher frequencies. This is the simplest example of a circuit which would reduce noise, because this would de-emphasize higher frequencies. And our objective in fact in short in the laboratory is to set up this circuit and its variations and to verify that this is indeed the case. Now, a little more about this circuit. You know, what we have drawn is only qualitative, a little more quantitative analysis of the circuit. You see, we see the quantity C r in this expression. All right, so the quantity C r. Now, many of you who would have dealt with these circuits, I am sure you might have dealt with these circuits in high school, is not it, with resistive and capacitive circuits. In class 12, not, not everybody, all right, does not matter. This resistive, this quantity, the product of the capacitance and resistance has a significance. One thing which you can tell me is, what are the units of this quantity? Yes, what are the units? Time, that is correct. So, units are units of time. So, in fact, this is called the time constant. 
CR is called the time constant of the circuit. Why it is called the time constant? We would need to understand by looking at a different kind of excitation. But at the moment, let us let us give this time constant. Let's let's abbreviate this time constant by tau naught, and let us rewrite the expression for h of omega naught in terms of tau naught. So essentially, h of omega naught is one by one plus omega naught squared. I'm sorry. So the question is, you see, the units of 1 by tau naught are going to be angular frequency, essentially radians per second. So, so what is it has, what, what happens at the frequency 1 by tau naught, right? So at capital omega equal to capital omega naught equal to 1 by tau naught, what is the magnitude h omega naught? It is 1 by square root of 2. What is so special about 1 by square root of 2? Now, if I have a sine wave of amplitude A, suppose you thought of the sine wave as a current signal going through a resistance. How much is the power consumed by the resistance? Suppose the resistance is of value 1 ohm. How much is the power consumed by the resistance? the square of the sine wave, is that right? Now, what it means is that it is the square of the amplitude which is indicative of the power, is that right? Now, so you see what is it that determines the, the power, how, how does the power relate to the amplitude? It relates to the square of the amplitude, is that right? So, Essentially, if I were to multiply the amplitude by 1 by square root of 2, what would happen to the power? It would come down by a factor of 2. So therefore, this point where the amplitude becomes 1 by square root of 2 has the significance of bringing the power down by a factor of half. So it is called the half power point. All right, this is a very important point on the curve. So let's mark the half power point. And in fact, one of the objectives in your experiment is to be able to decide the half power point in your circuit. So somewhere here, where you have one by tau naught, you would see that the amplitude falls to one by square root of two. How much is one by square root of two? About seventy percent. Okay, about point seven or something, right? So one of the things that you need to do in your experiment is to check for the half power point. In other words, check the point where the amplitude falls to 50 percent of what its amplitude is at very low frequency, at almost zero frequency. And ensure that that half power point agrees with what we calculate theoretically. That means at the angular frequency of 1 by tau naught, is that right? So you would know the resistance value, you would know the capacitance value and you would check that the half power point is indeed at the angular frequency 1 by r c. Now, I am going to put a challenge before you. And while you think about the challenge, and you know towards the end of the lecture, we will have somebody perform a good deed now, we might have somebody come up with an answer to the challenge. I want somebody to tell me, draw a similar curve of magnitude of h omega naught for this circuit. So, let us see who comes up with it first. And while somebody does that, so he or she would be asked to come and discuss it here in front of the audience. That is a reward. But while you do that, I am going to discuss a few other things. I am going to show you some of the things you are going to use tomorrow. How do you set up such a circuit? So to set up such a circuit, you are going to use something called a breadboard. This is a breadboard. A breadboard, you know, because it gives that impression of slices. Anyway, now, notice in this breadboard, please look at the markings of terminals very carefully in the breadboard. You notice there are several apertures here like this, I am marking the apertures with, with my or maybe I, I should mark it with, you know, so I, what I will do is I will sort of 
mark it this way. So you'll see the apertures. These are all apertures, small holes. And these holes have metal inside, right? Now, you must understand in the breadboard that this, from here to here, now you see a W, don't you? It's not, maybe it's not, it's not visible to you. But you know, in, in between, when you look at the breadboard closely, you'll see a W here in between at this point, right in the middle on the top row. And you'll also see a W here. Maybe what I'll do is I'll blacken this so you'll see it. Now can you see it somewhat? Yes. So similarly here, see so here W there. Now on one side of the W you have two horizontal lines. And on the other side of the W again you have two horizontal lines. All these four horizontal lines are equipotential lines. So they are all at the same potential. That means they are connected metallic, with a metal, with a metal line, metallically. Is that clear to everybody? Is the, now, in between, now there is a groove here which you simply ignore. All right, can everybody see that? Can, can everybody see what I am pointing out? Here, between this groove and this groove, I have several vertical, now you must understand these to be vertical lines. So each vertical line, you know, if you look carefully, you can count the vertical line has five apertures. Can you see that every vertical line has five apertures? Now, all these five apertures in a vertical line form one equipotential surface, right? So you have, you have as many equipotential surfaces or as many equipotential lines as the number of vertical half lines. In fact, they are numbered on top, I think nearly 62 or something like that, no, rather, I mean, yeah, about 62 lines or so on both sides. So why do, we, why do we have a configuration like this? Suppose I wish to connect, now I will show you how, how I would connect the resistance and the capacitance. I wish to connect the resistance and capacitance in series. So what I would do is put one of the terminals of the resistance on one of the equipotential lines, it is a little hard. Yes. And the other in another equipotential line. Why does the breadboard provide, this is a little hard, this resistance, so you know you have to be a little Yes. And I would take the capacitance and connect it to the same equipotential line as this resistance and bring it to another equipotential line on the other side. Is that right? Now that's now what would I do next? I would take a wire. I would allow this wire, now you see, I would connect the wire to the input of the resistance. And I would take the other point of the capacitance also through a wire. Maybe I should. So now what do I have here? I am holding the yellow line and the, the green line. So effectively if you look back at the circuit here, this is the yellow line here. Oh sorry, not, not on this. Yeah, all right. Let me draw it on another piece of paper. So I have resistance and capacitance. This is the yellow line here. And this is the green line. Is that clear? Does everybody associate the electrical connection properly now? Yeah, everybody clear? So what would I do? I would take this circuit which I have mounted on a breadboard. And I would connect these two points to the output of what is called a signal generator. Now, you in the laboratory would actually have, I believe, the signal generator and the display device, which is called the oscilloscope, both built into one. In fact, I believe it would look something like this. I am just putting it before you. I can't show you the system operate at the moment, but this is how it would look, right? 
So you would be using what is called the PC based oscilloscope. What is an oscilloscope? An oscilloscope is a device where a beam responds to the input voltage in such a way that the motion of the beam corresponds to the way in which that voltage varies in time. Right? So in other way, in other words, it is a graphical conversion of an electrical voltage. Right? Essentially, it depicts an electrical voltage graphically. So, what would you do in your experiment? You would actually connect a signal here between these terminals, a sinusoidal signal, and you would hold its amplitude constant and vary its frequency. And you would then study how, now you need to take one more wire to look at the output. So, I will take a red line. So, if you go back to this circuit, this is the red line. All right. And the oscilloscope would be connected. So, what you see here is the output between this between the red line and the green line. And to take the correspondence with the original circuit. And I am spelling this out very clearly, so that you have no mistakes tomorrow, is that right? This is the electrical point at which we are looking. So, that is about how you connect the, so it is a simple experiment. Now, this is the basic experiment. What is expected as you have seen in your write up is much more. I believe all of you must have received some instructions on Moodle, have you not? Yes? How many of you have received the Moodle instructions, can I just check? Yeah. So, uh, you see in those instructions I have mentioned a few variations on this experiment. One of the variations is to give not a sinusoidal input to this circuit, but a square input. By a square input I mean a voltage which varies like this. repeated periodically. What I would like you to study and as a challenge explain if possible is the waveform that you see at the output. So, if I were to give this square wave as an input, now here it would of course depend on the frequency to an extent. So, what I have suggested in the write up is that you try first a very low frequency. Now, if the frequency is very low, it is almost as if there were no repetition here, that is that's how one should interpret it. If the frequency is too high, then the circuit does not get time to stabilize. So, one would like you to study the variation of the behavior of the circuit when you go from a very low frequency towards higher and higher frequencies. All right? and if possible even to interpret this. Now, I shall only give you a hint, this is as I said a challenge to you. I will only give you a hint on how you would analyze what would happen in the context of a square wave. You see when you analyze the circuit, the resistive and capacitive circuit in the context of a square wave, you can no longer take recourse to phasers. Right? You must then go back to the basic, basic describing equation of the resistance and the capacitance. So, let us assume the input voltage is V in T and the, of course, the output voltage is the same as the voltage of across the capacitor which we shall call V C T. Now, what can we write as an expression for V in T in terms of V C T? So, for that we need to obtain the voltage across the resistance. How would we obtain the voltage across the resistance? The current times the resistance. How would we obtain the current? The current is essentially C d v c t d t. If you were to multiply this by the resistance, it is the drop across the resistance plus v c t gives you v n t. 
So, you have a differential equation describing V C T. Now, of course, many of you are familiar with how to solve a differential equation of this kind. This is the first, this is an example of a situation where a differential equation gives you beautiful insights into the behavior of the system. So, now the hint is solve this differential equation with V in T equal to the kind of waveform that you have. In fact, assume that that waveform does not repeat first. So, V C T is 0 initially and suddenly becomes a certain value after a point in time and study how V C T varies as a function of time with this input. So, that is the hint and try and correlate what you come out with as an answer to your differential equation with what you see on the oscilloscope screen when you do the experiment. Is that right? So, not only does this experiment teach you about the frequency response and how such a circuit can be used to suppress higher frequencies and emphasize lower frequencies, it also teaches you how to correlate the behavior of a system which is described by a differential equation with what you see is an input output pattern. Right? So, you have here an example of a system comprising of a resistance and a capacitance excited by a certain input function and the differential equation that describes the system is known and therefore, you are expected to also explain the output and all this is a part of measurement and instrumentation. Right? When you deal with systems in measurements and instrumentation, you must also be able to model the system and what we have here is a model for the system. And when you have a model for the system, you also sometimes know how the system would behave with a certain input. You can predict the output and verify that behavior experimentally. All right. So, these are all the objectives of this experiment. I have also given you one more variation in the write up that I have sent on Moodle and that is a further challenge. Suppose, I were to make the circuit a little more complicated by putting two more elements, what would happen? Right? I have given that as a part of the, that is all these are to test to stretch your imagination a little. Now, a few remarks about how one reads resistances. So, if I wait, now you, you have this resistance in front of you, yeah, you have connected this resistance here. You want to find out the value of the resistance. So, how do you do it? Look carefully at the resistance, let me put a white paper beneath it. Look carefully at the resistance. Do you see four bands on the resistance? Now, you will have to look carefully. You see three easily, but there is also one band here at the end, which is either silver or gold in color. Is that right? So, you do not see it as easily from a distance, but can you all see it now? Four bands, yes? Yeah. Now, the way to interpret the resistance is start from so, in fact, I should read it this way, all right. Think of each of these bands as a color code for a digit. The digits can be between 0 and 9, is that right? So, you have three digits there. Let us call the three digits A, B and C and then you have a band, a silver or a gold band. Okay. Now, the value of the resistance is the number a b into 10 raised to the power of c. So, for example, suppose a has the value 1, b the value 0 and c corresponds to 2, then you have 1 0 into 10 raised to the 2, that means 1 kilo ohm. All right. How do you decide the values a b and c? There is a very simple mnemonic which allows you to remember the values. B B Roy of Greater Bombay. had a very good wallet. (laughs) 
Is that right? Come on, tell me the colors. I forget, I have to check. I think it's green. Right? So that's this is zero. So you start from zero here, one there, and so on. Okay, so you can continue up to nine. All right, so simple mnemonic to remember the values of the resistance. To read a capacitance, you will understand tomorrow. There is a code on the capacitance which you must learn how to read. All right? So you learn how to read the capacitance tomorrow. Tomorrow, and whenever you have your lab, that is. Now, just to complete the discussion, although you are not going to use integrated circuits in your experiment tomorrow, but I still would like to show them to you. What you see here is what is called an integrated circuit, the thing that you see in black. Now, I will just keep it, you know, maybe, yeah, no, I Can you all see that it has pins on the side? Yes, you see pins on the side? I turn it, you can see pins on the side. Now, these pins are electrical points, they are, they are you know inside the circuit. And if I turn this integrated circuit around, it's a little difficult to see, but if I now you can when I, when I turn it, can you see there is a notch here? Can everybody see a notch there? Now, the notch, no, when, you, when you turn it, you can see it. In fact, there is a notch and there is also a, a dot there, when you look at it closely on this side. So, you see, your counting begins from this side of the notch. So, if I were to look towards the notch, your counting begins from the left of the notch, right? And you count in circular fashion, starting from this end and going back to the notch. So, pin number 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on in a circular fashion starting from the left of the notch and reaching the right. Okay, that is how you count the pins on an integrated chip. Now, what is normally given to you is the description of the inside of the chip. This is called a chip informally or an integrated circuit. So, what is normally given to you in a data sheet is the inside of a chip, what, what comes out on the pins. So, you must that is called a pin diagram. So, you must learn to read a pin diagram and use the pin diagram to connect your chip properly, all right, in a circuit. So much so then for connection of circuits and uh, for your RC circuit experiment tomorrow. Now, anybody who is game to the challenge that I posed now, what happens to that circuit? How does that circuit behave? Yes, good, 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 come. My name is Gautam. I am Gautam. 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 Mechanical department. Very good. So now he's derived the expression. So write down the expression straight away. So, just, just to write, just sketch the expression, I do not spend too much of time in deriving it. Just writing this, then I will write this. Write a little, all right, good. Now, just sketch this as a function of omega naught. No, no, do not go there, sketch it here. Raise, raise it, raise it a little bit, yeah. It's zero at 
omega naught equal to 0, this thing will be infinity. So, 1 That's by infinity right. is 0. Yeah. So, when omega naught tends to infinity, this thing will tend to 1. And when omega naught is 0, this tends to infinity. So, 1 by infinity is so, 0. That's right. So, so, the graph will be something like this. Good. Very good. That's correct. And the derivative I wrote here comes around like this. That's all right. That's fine. Good. Very good. So, what does this circuit do? This is called a high pass filter. Unlike what we had earlier, this one emphasizes higher frequencies and de-emphasizes lower frequencies. What application can it have? Well, of course, if you look at it in the noise context, it would amplify noise. That is not what we want to do, right? What it would typically do is to isolate the faster part of a phenomenon for you, not necessarily noise, right? For example, in a certain sense, in a certain region, this can be used as what is called a differentiator. So, you know, in the low frequency region, this can be used as a differentiator. So, it could give you approximately the derivative of a waveform in the low frequency region, all right? So, this is, you know, in the, in the low frequency region. So, in a certain frequency region, it could act as a, as a, as a differentiator, all right? That is nice. So, so much so then for the instructions, are there any questions that you would like me to answer before we disperse? So, if there are no questions, then we will conclude the lecture here.